Hello, uh, thanks for coming to today's video. Uh, in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at anal fissures. Uh, so let's begin, as always, with the definition. So uh, the definition of anal fissures is a tear uh, in the anoderm. And uh, what is the anoderm precisely? Uh, anoderm is the skin in the anus area. And in particular, in order to be called an anal fissure, it needs to be below uh, distal to the dentate line. And um, the dentate line uh, I can put a graph here or a diagram here. Uh, the dentate line is going to be a line that uh, right that right above there, uh, and it, and the anal fissure has to occur below there. And the reason is is because under that area, that's where you would tend to feel pain. Um, and so th that's the first diagram there, which is kind of a sagittal section. Then we have another diagram uh, over here, uh, which is showing. Uh, the posterior anal fissure there. So this is going to be the most common type, which is called a posterior anal fissure. And of course, um, and what you want to imagine is in, in this case, just to get you oriented, um, th this area up here is where the genitalia is going to be. So the here, if you have anal fissure here, uh, that's called an anterior anal fissure. And if you have an uh, anal fissure here, this would be called a posterior anal fissure. And just so you know, the posterior anal fissure is much more common than an anterior anal fissure. Uh, so, and that's what we've, we've uh, kind of showed here. So uh, what are the types? Uh, there's two types, acute, uh, which is an anal fissure that heals in about six weeks. And we also have a chronic, um, which is an anal fissure that fails conservative management. And so it'll last longer than six weeks. And since it fails conservative management, uh, the only other management option left for these patients is surgery. So uh, th this is going to be the chronic case. And this is usually some type of underlying pathology which is causing these recurrent strictures and the recurrent damage. And we'll get into some of those conditions in a little bit. Uh, so now let's uh, move on to uh, talking about the pathogenesis uh, of this condition. So uh, the pathogenesis pretty much revolves around anything that causes stretching, of the anal mucosa so much so uh, that it goes beyond its capacity and so once you go beyond the capacity what will happen of course you'll get a tear and this tear is going to be very painful uh, and it's going to be very difficult to manage these types of patients because uh, you know every time they defecate they're going to constantly ag uh, aggravate the tear and then it's going to lead to pain as palm defecation as we'll talk a little bit but what also may happen is uh, some patients will get a spasm and so when you get a spasm um, this begins to pull so as you can see here if you get a spasm it'll pull on both sides of the anal fissure outwards and so when you pull on the ends uh, this makes it very difficult to heal and it eventually becomes chronic so this spasm uh, spasticity can lead to a chronic um, anal fissure now what, why do anal fissures occur? Um, one, I guess, risk factor that has been noticed is uh, patients who have decreased blood flow to a certain part of their anus, this tends to increase the anal pressure. And if you have increased anal pressure, then this area will, you know, upon defecation or, or uh, pretty much upon defecation, it'll be more resistant to the uh, feces coming through. And so then that area will uh, tend to have fissures. So decreased blood flow has been associated with increased uh, anal pressure and this has been associated with increased risk of anal fissures. So this is one possible underlying pathology but of course uh, there's probably many more. So uh, with regards to pathogenesis um, that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, so let's just now let's focus on etiology. So what are the causes? Uh, it's split into two types. Primary which is usually due to trauma and secondary which is due to some underlying pathology so uh, we can go we can start with primary which is again uh, anything that can cause local trauma so when we think about trauma to the anus there's only you know a few things that can uh, cause this type of trauma uh, the first being you know having hard stool so patients who have chronic constipation very hard stool will be your classic uh, history of, of a patient with a lot of constipation. Uh, diarrhea, uh, prolonged diarrhea especially, um, you know, patients who have diarrhea for a really long time are at risk. 
uh, a vaginal birth delivery. Uh, as we know, um, you know, when, when a mother is delivering the child, this can sometimes lead to tear in the perineum, which can go all the way over to the uh, rectum. Uh, and finally, we have anal sex, and you know, this is an obvious cause. Uh, secondary, uh, we have it could be due to some type of previous anal surgery, uh, which increases you know the likelihood of uh, getting these fissures. Also, inflammatory bowel diseases such as Crohn's disease, and this is something that definitely needs to be ruled out right away if you have a patient with chronic anal fissures. Uh, granulomatous diseases um, also associated, uh, in particular, you know things such as TB and sarcoidosis um, can be associated with this. Uh, certain malignancies uh, can lead to secondary anal fissures, and finally STDs, um, HIV, uh, syphilis, and even chlamydia uh, can be associated with secondary fissures. So uh, these are the different causes. Uh, let's go ahead and start talking about the clinical presentation. The main clinical presentation is going to be pain with defecation. So this is really, really important, very, very uh, classic, and you know, So uh, pain with defecation, if you see that in a patient, one of the first things you do want to start thinking about is anal fissures. Uh, next, you can, you know, you, because it's bleeding, you can get uh, some bright rectal bleeding. Uh, and generally, it's not profuse. It's not, they won't see it in the toilet or in the uh, feces. It'll just be on a napkin. So it's going to be, as they're wiping, they just kind of notice uh, something on their napkin. And that, that's pretty much the only uh, symptom they have. Uh, it can be itchy. So some, sometimes they are per, uh, pruritic. Uh, some patients do complain of that. Uh, and also one thing to remember that when it becomes chronic, as in most conditions, there's less pain. So this is another thing to remember as well. Um, now, once you know, you've know you clinically suspected anal fissures, what will you see on inspection? Of course, first thing you want to do is you're going to want to um, you know, take a look, a visual inspection of the uh, anal area, and, and that's you know when you'll see the uh, actual uh, fissure. So uh, when it's an acute case, um, the lesion tends to be very fresh and, and really red. And so we, we have um, two diagrams here, uh, one of them being acute. So the acute one is the one on the left, and then here we have the chronic one. So what you can notice in the acute, so right there uh, where I've circled it, you can see that it's very red, uh, it looks fresh, looks like it just occurred, and so that tells you it's acute. Um, a chronic one, on the other hand, uh, will tend to have more raised edges, uh, so that's what you tend to see. And so, if you look at this diagram here, all that area right there, so that you know, upside down U shape area, you can see the air, it's red, uh, raised and hypertrophied. Uh, what you also tend to get is skin tags, um, and even in this diagram here, right there in the middle, uh, that's a fresh skin tag right there. So uh, and that's what you'll see in the chronic. So the chronic and the acute do look much more different. Uh, and they can be easily tell the part. Now, you know, as part of you know pain with defecation, you might think it's hemorrhoids. And so, in order to, to figure out if it's uh, hemorrhoids as well on top of anal fissures, you might be tempted to do a digital exam or even do a protoscopy. But if you if you see anal fissures, you do not do any digital exam, and you definitely do not do any. Uh, proctoscopic exam. And this is because if you if you do try to digitally uh, examine the patient or use a proctoscope, it can worsen the anal fissure and it can make it harder, more difficult to heal and more difficult to um, repair later and increase the risk of complications. So as soon as you see an anal fissure, you stop, you wait till the anal fissure heals, and then you move on to doing a digital rectal exam or a proctoscopic exam. So uh, something to be wary of. As soon as you see anal fissures, stop right there. Um, now, uh, so since we've talked about the clinical manifestations, uh, let's start talking about the treatment. So um, first-line treatment is going to be conservative. Uh, and so what you want to do in first-line treatment, the first thing you want to focus on, because these patients have chronic constipation, this is one of the risk factors. And so trying to lessen the constipation uh, can uh, oftentimes decrease the trauma that the anal fissure is uh, feeling and eventually um, heal. So uh, one of the first things you want to do is you want to give the, you want to change your diet. So increase fiber, uh, you know, and, and decrease fats. That can help a lot. Also, because of the decreased blood flow, um, you know, we do give nitroglycerin. This is going to be a, a 
topical nitroglycerin uh, can help. And you know, be, again, to decrease the constipation, you can try giving uh, stool softeners and even uh, bulk fiber supplements uh, to try and get you know more of a, a easier time with uh, defecation. Uh, and again, a lot of times, you know, because of the pain. Um, the patients don't want to defecate because every time they defecate they have pain and of course in order for it to heal we need to get rid of get, get out of this constipation cycle and they need to start defecating normally so it's also prudent to give uh, some sort of uh, analgesic or some sort of uh, cream an exercising cream to help them out uh, which you can also give uh, which we can also tr uh, have them use is something called a sits bath and so sits bath um, we have it here so it's, it's it kind of rests on the toilet and you put hot water in here and the patient, you know, especially after defecation when they have pain, uh, they can just kind of, uh, you know, rest uh, their, their gluteal area in here and then that tends to help them with some of the pain as well. And again, this pain relief is really, really important so they can have normal defecation bowel movements and then they can uh, lead to healing of this anal fissure. Uh, how long do you do this treatment for? You, you do it for about one month. Um, in this one month, uh, most patients will heal, and so if they heal, then you're pretty much done. However, um, sometimes you get patients who uh, don't heal, uh, and so in this circumstance, uh, what you try to do is you repeat the treatment for another month. Uh, and so what you're hoping is, and after this month, uh, most again, most people will tend to heal. Uh, if it doesn't heal after two months of treatments, it's most likely um, so if it doesn't heal after two months of treatment, it's most likely a chronic fissure. So you need to figure out, well, why is, what, what, why is this chronic? Uh, the, before you do any other treatment, um, you want to rule out Crohn's because this could be one of the presentations of Crohn's disease. Uh, and you do that with endoscopy. So you do quick endoscopy, uh, look for any uh, of the classical uh, findings you'll find in Crohn's. Now, if you do find Crohn's, um, if it's Crohn's, yes then you treat the Crohn's, so it's pretty easy. However, if it's not Crohn's, so if you do it and, and you do the endoscopy and there's no signs of Crohn's, then there's uh, other types of management options for the fissure that you can then undergo. And again, if it's not Crohn's, most likely it's gonna be due to some type of chronic spasm. And so your whole management is gonna be, or treatment is gonna be geared towards uh, reducing the spasm and so one of the first uh, things you can try doing is giving Botox uh, and so we know Botox is a relaxant and it can definitely help relieve some of the spasm uh, if that doesn't work calcium channel blockers such as diltiazem or even uh, nifedipine can help uh, oftentimes and your final option is going to be uh, topical uh, botanical so you're, you're going to try to do this for about another month and of course if you if you do this for a month and you still don't get uh, healing, uh, then that's about 90 days of the patient with all sorts of treatment not being, uh, you know, be, not, not being uh, cured, you know, not being uh, allevi able to alleviate the symptoms. So your final option will be um, to do surgery. And so uh, there are a few surgical options. I'm going to talk about the two most common ones here. Uh, the first one being a, a lateral internal sphincterectomy. Um, so this is this is very common, and then there's a, a, a little bit of a newer treatment, uh, which is called the uh, endoanal VY advancement flap. Uh, so we'll talk about both of them right now uh, and kind of compare them off of each other. So in um, a lateral internal sphincterectomy, uh, what what you're doing here, as you can see, uh, the first thing that you do is you dilate the uh, anal canal here. And you can see that the doctor is holding a scalpel. And what he's going to do is he's going to just tear into the internal sphincter in different areas. Um, and so, and again, you want to use the internal sphincter, not the external sphincter, because the external sphincter is under conscious control or voluntary control. And so, you don't want them to lose that ability. So, um, and by doing the, by cutting into that, then that releases the uh, spasm, and it can help, um, you know. Uh, alleviate the fissure and then lead to normal defecation. Um, in the endoanal VY advancement flap, uh, you're not making any cuts uh, actually on the um, internal sphincter. 
what you're doing is you're making an incision outside, like a V-shaped incision right there on the outside of the actual anal canal. Then you're pushing up this V-shaped uh, uh, this, this incision uh, up over the actual fissure. Then you stitch at the bottom there and to, to make it a Y shape, as you can see, so you're going to shape at the bottom and then on, on the side right there, and then you end up getting this Y shaped uh, stitch, and that's why it's called the VY uh, advancement flap, because first you have a V, and then you end up with a Y. So, and, th and this can help cover up the fissure and then uh, hopefully lead to healing. Um, now, there's some positive and negatives for each one. Uh, lateral internal sph uh, sphincterectomy can lead to fecal incontinence. And this can be very mild to just maybe flatulence or maybe, you know, just a little bit of uh, defecation in the underwear. Or it can be very severe where they just defecate completely without control. So this is very, very difficult for some people to accept. Um, however, in the indoor-anal VY advancement flap, you don't have any problem with fetal incontinence. But there's, only, there's about an 85% uh, pass rate, or you can say, you know, success rate. Uh, so not all the um, VY advancement flaps tend to work. So they got a little bit of a, a failure rate there. So it depends on, you know, I guess each case scenario, what's more important? Is it more important to be, you know, successful? Or, you know, fecal incontinence is just a no, no issue. So depending on the patient and uh, the circumstance, you're going to pick one over the other. So hope you enjoyed this video. See you guys in another one. Thanks.